legislation. Ms. Henry ascended to the role of chief economist in HSBC before being promoted to the role of chief global economist. In this role, Ms. Henry undertakes numerous influential responsibilities, including being responsible for all of HSBC's economic forecasts and global thematic economic research outputs. She also holds a wide range of incredible positions, including being part of the chief economist community at the World Economic Forum. So without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm round of applause to Ms. Janet Henry. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you can hear me okay? Yep. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I, I've seen the program of speakers um, that you have speaking to you over the course of the next few days. Um, I'm very privileged to be alongside a couple of ECB members, um, a member of royalty, um, and a Nobel Prize winning economist. I don't believe you have many economists from the financial sector. Um, obviously, I am one, so this will be probably a slightly different presentation to many of the others that you will have. Um, I won't be showing you any equations. Um, I will be speaking quite broadly. Um, as an economist in the financial sector, I speak to, speak to a broad range of clients. Some of them have very short attention spans. Some of them think very short term. Some of them speak, uh, think very long term. Um, but I'll hopefully um, give you a few things um, to think about. Um, and in terms of, of what I want to, to talk about, um, it's some of the, um, the key questions I'm not sure we've got the right version of my presentation here, actually, because I can see the colors have changed. Um, but I'll, I'll go with it. Um, but I'll apologize in advance if any of my slides have gone astray. Um, so these are some of the questions I'm getting from clients um, at the moment in financial markets. Um, obviously, we've been through a period of very rapid inflation over the course of the last year. Um, the most frequent question I've got from everyone in recent months and certainly over the last year is when will the US Federal Reserve stop raising interest rates? When will they have won the battle against inflation? And they do that um, without delivering um, a hard landing. Um, a lot of optimism recently about the impact of China reopening um, on the global economy. Um, a certain number of questions on Europe now, actually, now that the gas prices have come back down. Um, but I know you've got a lot of presentations on Europe um, today and tomorrow, so I won't focus too much on Europe. And then um, once people get beyond the short term challenges regarding um, the peak um, in interest rates, um, a lot of questions regarding whether we are now in a new era um, for inflation. So. Let me just start off with one chart regarding um, financial markets. What you've seen over the course of the last few months is that left-hand chart. Um, it's just a chart of global equity prices versus the US dollar index. And what you've seen since October, November last year um, is suddenly a bit of a turnaround. Um, we've seen equity markets, which were quite bombed out, um, rallying quite strongly. Um, the dollar, which had been persistently strengthening because the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates in the fight against inflation. And when people were very nervous about the outlook, the dollar was strengthening. Um, all of that started to reverse to some degree as well. And, and the main drivers for that, that change in financial market sentiment was um, partly um, the, um, the, the growing expectation that we were at least nearing the peak for inflation. So what you've got on the right hand side is a chart of financial market expectations for policy rates. And what they're basically telling you is that whether you look at the ECB, the Bank of England, or the Federal Reserve, that they will all have finished raising interest rates in the course of the next few months, and then will pretty quickly set about starting to cut them. Um, in some cases, cutting them by, by the end of 2024 um, by up to 200 basis points, um, or certainly 150 or so in the case um, of the Federal Reserve. And as I say, that, that change in sentiment that's come through is pretty much driven by this. 
um, it, it's a chart of inflation rates. You've, you've got China at the bottom there, and China's a totally different situation on the inflation front. I'll come on to China um, a little bit later. Um, it is just the fact that all of those um, charts for the UK at the top, um, inflation may have only fallen, um, you know, less than a pole point, um, but it is finally pointing in the direct, right direction. Um, and with energy prices easing, Europe too, um, and the US, you've now seen inflation fall back um, to something with, with a 6% handle um, on it. So for financial markets, that's almost enough at the moment. Yes, they're asking the question, are we ever going to get back to 2%? But as long as inflation is starting to point downwards rather than upwards, that seems to be um, enough. Even if it's pretty much all driven by energy. Um, I mean, this is, I think, quite an interesting chart. It's just a kind of spot chart. What is the current inflation rate in all of these countries around the world? You've got a whole array of emerging economies on here um, and advanced economies. And it's just broken down into how much is food, how much is energy, and how much is everything else. Um, and, and what you can see, looking at those little red columns, um, we've heard so much about the energy story. And at one point, in most countries, energy was accounting for over half of the inflation. And what you can see now, and for all of these countries, for some it's just kind of November data, some it's December, some it's even January data. Actually, energy is now accounting for a relatively small share of the inflation. In Brazil, where they've got subsidies, it's actually detracting from inflation. Um, in some of the European countries, it's still quite big. Um, Italy and the UK um, are amongst those. Um, but in a lot of other countries, it's actually food and core inflation where you are seeing a little bit more of the pressure. Now, I will come on to um, back to the inflation story a little bit later, but I want to move on to the growth picture. Because one of those key questions that I said to you at the start was, is the US going to have a hard landing? Is it going to have a soft landing? Uh, and this is something that um, people like to come up with. In fact, anyone that listened to the Today program this morning, as I did, as I was driving up to, um, to, to Coventry, um, every half an hour, the headline was, UK avoids recession because it it was zero, it wasn't minus 0.1. For some reason, everyone is obsessed with this idea that if we're not in recession, everything's okay. Even if it's zero, it's okay. Um, yeah, it, it's never as straightforward as that to some degree. But when we think about the underlying story and what's driving the real economy, one of the big concerns globally and where we are seeing some impact to varying degrees around the world is via the housing markets. And that's what the left-hand chart is showing you. It's, it's the prices side. Um, it's what's happened to house prices from the peak. Um, and these are average numbers, clearly. And what you've got on the right-hand side is a lot of those economies, they didn't have a big housing correction during the global financial crisis. Um, they've had persistent increases in house prices, and they're also tied into variable interest rates. You know, in Germany, you take out a 20-year mortgage, it doesn't change for 20 years the rate that you are paying. In the US, you'll take out a 20 or 30-year mortgage. If rates go down, you refinance. If rates go up, you just stay on the 20 or 30 year mortgage rate that you're on. In Sweden, in New Zealand, and to some extent, half of the UK, when interest rates go up, your mortgage payment changes um, every month. But when we look at economies like Sweden, like New Zealand, um, these are some of the economies where we really are forecasting a hard landing in the truest sense, some quite significant recessions. And they're among the economies where, at the moment, they're still raising interest rates. We expect them to continue raising interest rates quite aggressively because despite this real hit to the economy, inflation is still way too high. But we think they will be able to, because of the depth of the recession, actually cut interest rates by the end of the year. Um, elsewhere, we're not as confident, certainly not in the majors. Because while housing market stories are playing out everywhere in the advanced economies, um, as interest rates rise, this is the way you, you exert some slowdown in demand. What's been quite interesting in the US is, is that right-hand chart. 
which shows you the way in which the housing market story is playing through. They've seen a more modest decline in house prices, but they have seen a contraction in residential investment spending. That's a kind of quarter on quarter series. Those red columns that you can see a deep residential construction recession, not quite on par with the global financial crisis, but on par with any other US recession. But GDP, certainly in the second half of 2022, was still growing. Those are the little black columns. Now, if you take the standard definition of a recession that I heard, every half an hour on the Today program this morning, they were saying, um, you know, a definition of a recession is two negative quarters. That, that's too simplistic. There's a lot of moving parts to GDP. Inventories matter, net trade matters. Um, the US had two negative quarters in the first half of 2022, but it wasn't really in a recession. Um, in the US, they have a, a, an organization called the, the National Bureau of Economic Research, the NBER, um, who define a recession based on the broad economy. Now, there's a lot of lines in this chart, but bear with me because I think it, it shows you the whole story of the US economy since late 2021. So the MBER, when they decide whether the US economy is in a recession, these are the main indicators they look at. They look at industrial production, they look at real incomes, real consumer spending, employment, and such like. And what you can see is actually the, the very important one, which is real incomes, they were contracting from late 2021. That's when the big fiscal stimulus, we remember we had two huge stimulus packages from President Trump, one from Biden. Um, you saw that big contraction um, on the, the fiscal fade coming through and monthly prices in inflation were rising. You didn't see it necessarily in the year-on-year -year rate, but monthly inflation was picking up. Um, now, that's actually started to abate, but you've had periods when business sales were contracting. You've had periods, I mentioned about residential construction, um, and periods when um, consumer spending were contracting. Um, and employment has continued to grow. Um, and now, the next leg of the recession um, is, is industrial production. That red line that was very, very strong, good spending was very, very strong, um, has now started to roll over to some degree. And yet the labor market in the US is still adding construction jobs and it's still adding manufacturing jobs. So just because the US might avoid a recession, a traditional recession, that does last two quarters and is enough for the Fed to cut rates and they don't get a quick bounce back. What's actually happening in the US is just a much more protracted slowdown that's been underway for the last year and we expect to be even weaker in 2023 um, and still have quite a subdued recovery in 2024. It's just a much more extended period. But this latest leg of the US recession, the rest of the world is starting to feel. Um, because when you look at what's been happening in the US, um, the, the left-hand chart is showing you household savings rates. This has been a big talking point, as I'm sure many of you are aware. During the pandemic, people couldn't spend everything they were getting in terms of their fiscal response. They weren't going out socializing. Um, they were spending a lot of money on goods. And But in the US, as the economy reopened, households have lowered their savings rates quite significantly. Um, they're well below pre-pandemic levels. Levels. That hasn't happened yet across Europe. That's still an upside risk that's possible to come through if European households do desire, decide to lower their savings rates. Um, but the right-hand chart shows you the split in spending. What you saw by the US consumer was that goods prices rose, goods spending, and this is in volume terms, rose dramatically at the start of 2021, and it's basically flatlined since people have inevitably been spending more on services. And it is that good spending that the rest of the world is now feeling. Um, because when you look at this left-hand chart, um, which is of real imports, US imports, again, on a quarterly basis, 
Um, it's in the third and the fourth quarter of 2022. There was an outright contraction in the goods that the US was importing from the rest of the world. And the US wasn't alone in this. We've seen this same rotation of spending in nearly every economy um, that reopened. And so when you look at the trade data globally, export volumes in the advanced economies and particularly in the emerging economies started to fall back significantly. So what we're starting to see in a number of economies, particularly in the US, is, is the beginning of an industrial recession, the beginning of a world trade um, recession. Some economies actually benefit more than demand than others. Some of the worst affected countries were the ones that were most exposed to the electronic sector. Remember a year or two ago, it was all about component shortages and you couldn't get a new car because there's so many chips in a new car and there was a shortage of chips and the electronics producers improved dramatically. Well, that is no longer um, the case. Um, so a lot of the electronics producers have been exposed and have now seen a much more significant weakening. Of course, there are variations, whether you're tied into logic chips or memory chips or industrial electronics or consumer electronics, but the broad story is that they've been pointing downwards. What we've also seen over the course of the last few years is a diversion of trade. Now, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about deglobalization. Um, we need to remember that some of these kind of deglobalization forces started before the pandemic, the, the, the Trump and G trade wars, um, the tariffs that were imposed by the Trump administration. Um, and so even before the pandemic began, we were already seeing some rotation um, of trade. And that's what this chart is showing you. It's the change in US goods imports in the five years from 2017 to 2020, 2022. This is the total change over that period. Vietnam's um, US imports from Vietnam over that period have grown by over 150%. And US imports from China have actually fallen slightly. And it's not just Vietnam, the broader ASEAN region has also grown by much more than overall um, US um, imports. Um, so there is a rotation. And, and the trouble is the countries that benefited most on the way up will be exposed to a large extent a lot more um, on the way down. So when we think about the rest of 2023 and beyond, if the US is weakening and Europe is weakening, whether it's in recession or flirting with one, certainly a very, very weak growth backdrop, there's now a certain amount of optimism that China reopening is going to lift the global economy because China um, has been very important. It was massively important in 2009 um, when we came out of the global financial crisis. An enormous stimulus really did help to lift um, the global economy. And now we've seen a quicker than expected reopening um, in China. But the way we think about this China reopening, and, and a lot of this is informed by what's happened elsewhere in the world, is that it will be a bit different this time. Um, this is it's just to remind me to talk about tourism. Um, Thailand's um, tourism figures um, on a monthly basis from various, various parts um, of the world. Um, as China reopens, um, obviously we will see in, in China is some improvement in the labor market as demand picks up. Lower income people will increase their good spending to some degree. But most of the unleashing of pent up demand will be in areas of the service sector. We are already seeing box office attendances are picking up, restaurants and such like, domestic transport, domestic tourism. And as they've been gradually reopening the border to Hong Kong, we've seen the power of those cross-border tourism. And parts of Asia in particular will be seeing a bigger boom coming through on the tourism front. It's not necessarily going to lift trade very much. So for trade dependent economies, they can't rely on China to do what it has done um, in the past. The other area that's likely to be somewhat different in the coming year is the mix of investment spending. Um, I mentioned 2009, what happened in 2009 when we had a huge fiscal stimulus. Well, we also had one in 2015, 2016. 
And this is just showing you what happened to infrastructure investment, manufacturing investment, property investment. It was really strong across the board. Um, so whether you are a capital goods producer like Germany or a commodity producer like Australia um, or, or you, you produced anything else that was related um, to manufacturing investment, everyone benefited to some degree. In the coming year, I think it will be different. China had a weak year in 2022, but it was mainly concentrated in consumption. Um, because of COVID restrictions, and in the property sector, they've had quite a significant property um, recession. Other parts of the economy held up pretty well. Um, they, they held up well in terms of infrastructure spending. It was growing at nearly 15% by the end of the year, um, and um, manufacturing investment was actually quite strong. They are likely to be slowing over the course of the next year. Um, it's the property sector uh, we've, where we've seen a raft of measures to support the property sector that we're likely to see um, some improvement. Uh, so it will be those countries that are tied into the property sector. We've already seen things like iron ore prices. You can see on the left-hand side, financial markets and trading, they always price in new information the second it becomes available before demand actually picks up. Iron ore prices have already picked up quite significantly, much more than something like, like copper um, or oil. Um, but it's going to be a different mix to 2022. In 2022, China, especially in the second half of the year, was a disinflationary influence on the world. Um, I don't think it's going to single-handedly cause global inflation, but given the weakness in demand elsewhere, you might expect inflation to fall back on a more sustained basis quite swiftly. Um, but actually, there's going to be certain areas of commodity prices where China could contribute to some of these inflationary pressures being a little bit more sticky. And certainly that, that, that right-hand chart is a purchasing manager survey globally. There's a composite survey, input prices and output prices. It's a diffusion index. What it's telling you is that more people still see rising prices than falling prices, just not quite as many more as was the case um, six months ago. So let's link this back into inflation and into monetary policy. I showed you a chart at the, at the beginning that showed you that inflation has actually peaked. Um, and where we are now seeing elements of deflation coming through is not just in energy, um, but actually in core goods um, in particular. Uh, again, you know, we saw goods demand being strong during periods of lockdown. You could get everything online. Um, and then that's where we saw the initial demand. Um, and as part of supply chain resilience, remember, companies wanted to hold more inventory. Um, but what we are now seeing is something of an inventory adjustment underway as companies, retailers um, have been built up too much inventory just as demand um, has plummeted. So core goods inflation has fallen back dramatically. Um, it's been falling on a monthly basis. And depending on whether it continues to fall at the recent monthly rate or it just goes back to the pre-pandemic average, um, it could actually turn negative. Now, what I point out here is just because what this is happening as part of an inventory adjustment basis, that doesn't mean that we are permanently going back to goods deflation. We had about 20 years almost of almost persistent goods price deflation with China's labor market opening to the global economy, um, as well as other emerging economies. We had great efficiencies cross-border. Uh, we had a lot of automation in the goods sector. We are, as a part of this supply chain resilience and some of the deglobalization effects, we are going to see some more friction in global trade. It's unlikely given some structurally higher input prices, which even include energy as well as labor costs, it's unlikely we're going to go back to goods price deflation of the type that we've been used to over the course of the last couple of decades. But in the near term, goods price inflation is likely to continue to weaken. Um, not everywhere seeing the same effect. That right-hand chart just compares what's happening to goods inflation in the Eurozone versus the UK and the US. So far, we haven't seen it fall back quite as much in the Eurozone. But it's the right-hand chart 
I wanted to draw your attention to because the right hand chart shows you um, that it's service sector inflation where we are now seeing um, the pressures. Um, in some cases in the US, it is lifted to a large degree what is happening by rentals, but even excluding rentals, it is the non, um, even the non-housing related service sector inflation. That's where demand is stronger. That's where we're seeing most of the, um, the service sector um, inflation. But this is what central banks are concerned about. You know, financial markets are very keen to say we're very close to the peak in tightening. Rates will be coming down. Inflation is now persistently heading lower. But central banks know that they can't relax yet because wage growth is still at a rate that is not consistent with getting back to their 2% inflation targets. And wage growth can, can lag. Um, inflation quite significantly. Now, on the, um, the, the, the wage growth story, it is the UK that's been the most worrying. If you look at that, that black line for the UK, you can see that private sector, well, total wage growth is approaching 7%. Um, private sector wage growth is over 7%, and public sector wage growth is about 3%. But given the array of strikes in place across um, the public sector in the UK, public sector pay growth is likely to rise higher. Um, in the Eurozone, wage growth is a bit lower. But in Europe, we do actually get multi-year pay deals. We've had some significant minimum wage hikes. We've had even bigger ones across Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so actually, in many ways, next year's wage growth will reflect more of this year's um, inflation. It does lead to some rigidities um, within wage setting um, and therefore some stickiness regarding inflation. In the US, actually, we have seen um, wage growth start um, to slow. So wage growth now in the US um, has fallen to 4.4%. Now, productivity is quite weak still. So 4.4% annual wage growth is not consistent with getting back to 2% inflation, which is still the target of central banks, which is why the Federal Reserve is still uh, raising interest rates. They still know that they're probably not going to sustainably get back towards their target, even if we do still see downside surprises in the next few months that they still need to, um, to tighten policy. Um, and, and, and the truth is, there are a lot of things on the labor market that differ across countries. Some of them might be cyclical, some of them might be structural. And central banks, when they're setting policy today, that will probably influence the economy in 12, 24 months, and they're thinking about what it means for inflation on a two to three year view, they're having to take a view on how much of these labor market shortages that are underway in many places are actually going to um, continue. So you can see on the left-hand chart, unemployment rates at historical lows pretty much across the board. That's been picking up a little bit um, in Germany, and, and participation rates have been doing some quite odd things. Um, in France, which has already had a very low participation rate, it seems like they are benefiting from some of their previous labor market reforms. Participation rates are now higher than they were pre-pandemic. Um, Germany's has always been high. The US, it's been creeping back up, almost back at pre-pandemic levels. And the UK seems to have a particular challenge um, actually, the participation rate has been edging um, lower. Um, it was pre-pandemic, and it has continued to do so. And, and a lot of that is related to, to long-term sick. Sick. A number of people on long-term sick might be related to the health service, um, as well as um, some other factors. And of course, we've got the particular challenge regarding uh, regarding Brexit. Um, I could talk about labour markets for half an hour, but I won't. Um, I'm going to finish on on central banks. Because when we think about the challenge that the Federal Reserve has versus the ECB, we need to remember they have different mandates. The Federal Reserve actually has a dual mandate. So this is a chart that I've adapted from Charles Evans at the Chicago Fed. It's the Fed's bullseye chart. So what they try to achieve is full employment, which they've suggested is around 4.2%. Um, and they try to deliver core inflation, core PCE inflation, um, at around 
And then, like every good central bank, they say, in two years from now, we'll be back in that bullseye zone. That's their forecast for the end of 2024. They are a little bit higher on inflation, a little bit higher on unemployment, but they are back in the acceptable um, range. Um, and this is why they're saying the market's expecting rate cuts too soon, but they're still saying they're going to get there for their own credibility. They have to say they're getting there. They have to set policy with the goal of getting there. Um, our forecasts are a little bit different. We, we're not convinced that they will necessarily get back to target. We think they'll, they will manage to get inflation by the end of 2024 back below the 3% level, but only at the cost of a more significant rise um, in interest rates. So we aren't looking for rate cuts until close to the middle of 2024. And even then, we think that they will be um, somewhat modest. But, but really what we're saying for the Federal Reserve, um, as they get closer to their inflation target, they get further away from their unemployment target, that's the point at which they have to balance up the risks um, and try to set policy um, appropriately. And at the moment, um, financial markets um, are uh, believe um, that the central banks will do what it takes um, and that we're going to have something of a Goldilocks scenario. Um, they may need to reassess their thoughts um, on, on whether they can actually lower inflation quite as painlessly. Uh, and the ECB, it's a little bit different. I mentioned some of the rigidities within the inflation targets. Um, within labour markets in Europe, wage growth isn't as high. But there are many reasons why it will stay sticky because of multi-year pay deals, minimum wage rises and the existence of short shift schemes. So people go on short shift schemes and they're paid a bit like our furloughing scheme in the UK. So you don't get slack in the labour market. Um, but also what's interesting um, in Europe, um, when you look at what financial markets are pricing in on five year inflation, um, admittedly, they were too low. But now, arguably, they are too high relative to the ECB's mandate, which is all about um, price um, stability. Um, so actually, for the ECB, we're not expecting any rate cuts even by the end of 2024. And the question is how much more they're going to have to raise interest rates. Um, we think they'll probably only raise interest rates another half a percent um, because um, the economy will be slowing down. Whether it's an outright recession or just flirting with one um, will, will depend to some extent on what happens on savings. Um, but the credit growth numbers are certainly um, slowing down. So, so broadly, they're, they're the main points um, I wanted to make. I, I said the question is that, you know, is the US going to have a hard or a soft landing? To some extent, it will have no landing. It's just going to have three years of really quite protracted, weak growth. We don't have a deep consumer recession. Half of consumers are already in recession. Half of consumers are not. Um, they've got a lot of savings. Um, China does um, pose some upside risk to China growth from the reopening, even if it's just for a few quarters. Um, the global lift will not float all boats, but it will support tourism sectors and certain areas of property, commodity demand. Um, and central banks, I agree, are getting close to the peak of their tightening. But in the past, usually you had Fed tightening and then they cut rates as soon as the recession began. You had two negative quarters, and then you had a strong bounce back. Because we have rates on hold for quite an extended period there, and no easing, the monetary, the, 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 the response of the economy will be slower this time, and it is a more protracted um, slowdown. I haven't gone into the medium term outlook for inflation so much, but even when you look at our 2024 forecasts for growth and inflation, what we are talking about is some deterioration in the growth inflation trade-off. Pre-pandemic, it was a case of growth in the advanced economies being, well, certainly in the US and maybe the UK, growth of maybe 2.5% and inflation of 1.5%. Um, I think on a medium-term view, it will be the other way around, um, that any given growth rate is associated with a slightly higher rate of inflation. So I'll leave it there. I hope I've left a bit of time for questions. Um, and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ms. Henry, for that incredibly insightful speech. Uh, your views on the current global economic outlook are certainly ones to take careful note of during these uncertain times.
so with that, I'd now like to progress quickly to the Q&A session where we will be taking some in-person questions from the audience. Uh, in the fourth row. Hello, my name is Yesel. I'm from CIDE, Mexico City. Uh, and especially thinking about the inflation and the real, the rate of labor market grabs, what's the prospect of the quality of life for the new generation who is not, unable to purchase house like older generations any longer, yet have to spend large amount of their salary in renting on top of the um, unemployment rate and high inflation? Um. Yeah, a very fair question for someone of your generation um, to be asking. Uh, as they say, this probably will be um, the first generation where living standards are not higher than their parents' generation, certainly um, in the post-war um, period. Um, so it's, it's going to be, I mean, when we think about growth rates, um, the major, you know, real economy growth rates, you, you have the demographic element, you have the growth in the working population, and then you have the productivity element. Um, and really, it's the productivity element that is vitally important because you can't, on a sustainable basis, have wage growth that's higher um, than, a, than productivity and delivering that 2% um, inflation. So I, I wish I could offer... Um, a, something really encouraging on growth um, that would make you feel better. But where I would be a bit more positive still is on the technological side. And I think, I think you are getting some speeches over the next couple of days that relate to innovation and to technology. And I've talked a lot about the goods sector and real growth and world trade. And a lot of it is related to goods. A lot of things that are happening in the service sector actually are much harder to measure. You know, there are a lot of jobs out there that are not even measured because, you know, who knew that people could make a living as an Instagram influencer um, or trading Bitcoin um, or, or crypto and such like. You know, there are a whole array of jobs that didn't exist um, previously. And there are a whole way in terms of living standards that are um, immeasurable to some extent. Um, so I think there are other things that influence living standards, but on the property side, um, I think we will have to have certain elements of, of land reform and property reform and changes in government policy. Because as you say, you know, I'm sure you, you've all got grandparents are saying, well, we didn't have mobile phones in our day and we didn't go to Spain on holiday, etc. You know, that's not very reassuring if you have no prospect of ever having um, your own home. So uh, I, would, I would say there has to be some changes regarding land reform and property uh, and government provision um, regarding property. Uh, and at the moment, the speed with which some property prices are falling in some parts of the world, um, they will eventually become a little bit more um, affordable. So I wish I could give you a better answer on that one. Thank you so much for your question and thank you for that answer. Go ahead. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good question um, because, you know, I think what, what the pandemic showed was um, the, the challenges faced with just having, as you say, one site. You know, what we'd already seen before the pandemic started given the, the, the strains between the US and China, if you were reducing, relying on China 100%, you might move 20% of your production, maybe 10% to Indonesia, 10% to Taiwan, um, and you know, you'd have slightly more diversified. Uh, but then during the pandemic, especially on things like pharmaceuticals or chips, um, it was, well, you need some closer to home. We need some control over them. Um, and so I think from an insurance and a resilience perspective, you do need some more diversified supply chains. But from a, the inflation element and the cost of production element, um, it needs to be efficient. Because if you just do it right, we're bringing that home and that home and we're getting, uh, you know, five people in middle America to do the job rather than five people um, in Shenzhen, it's going to be more expensive. 
But if you're building a state-of-the-art factory to produce it much more efficiently, where you don't even need one man, you know, rather than five in Shenzhen, it could actually increase productivity. Because I think, you know, people, t people argue as to why we had for a decade such a job-rich and investment-poor recovery. Um, and I would argue it's because we had, you know, because labor was so cheap. That's why you had such an investment poor recovery and uncertainty about future demand was so high, you had such low investment. Because labor has become so much more expensive um, and there's a need for more resilience and some production closer to home, um, that might actually encourage more automation in certain areas that might be even more productive and reduce some of the inefficiencies from having more diversified supply chains. So it, it would depend on the sector. Um, but there are some real opportunities there. And, and obviously, governments are influencing it as well by their incentives. And now we're getting into a whole uh, friction on that. I'm sure you've been following the, the debate regarding electric cars and the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, and now Europe trying to do something similar. So it is setting off a whole round of government policy related to incentives to encourage this in a way that I hope still encourages efficiency rather than just relocating for tax advantages. Thank you so much, Ms. Henry. I hope that answers your question. We'll be taking one last in-person question from the audience. Go ahead. Um, yes. Um, okay. Especially in the, in the line of what you said about the housing market, um, um, in the last months, uh, one always hears something about the housing bubbles bursting as well, and you always uh, also have the graph um, about the uh, property prices sinking in Sweden. Um, what do you think about such uh, such um, such people or such uh, predictions of a housing bubble bursting in Sweden and then spilling over to Europe? Is it really a real nation or is it rather some, uh, some predictions who are more safe and Yeah, that, that, I mean, it's interesting. Sweden, um, I think, is going to be interesting, and New Zealand would be the other one. You know, they are the two countries that had the what I would say were the biggest housing bubbles and the smallest, if any, adjustment during the global financial crisis. But what's really interesting is that they're both central banks are making it clear that even though the housing markets are to some extent imploding and they're getting very big housing market reductions, their primary concern is still inflation. So they're both saying they're still going to raise rates quite a lot um, because the first thing they need to do is massively raise, uh, squeeze inflation out of the system. If they can do that swiftly, even if it's the expense of quite a lot of short-term pain, they can at least then start to cut interest rates and get the economy on a more sustainable um, path. And, and also, what we've got to remember, as a consequence of the global financial crisis, you had a lot more regulation regarding banks and lending. Um, and a lot of the regulators, if I look at Australia and New Zealand, some of the work that's been done by their own regulators say that the finance, the banking system would be okay up to, you know, kind of 30, 35% drop in house prices without generating the kind of damage that we saw as a consequence um, of subprime blowing up um, in, in the US back in, in 2008, 2009. So inevitably, when you have a credit problem, and there are bad loans, there will be some domino effect and spillovers, but banks currently have quite a lot of capital. Um, and while, so I don't think it poses the risk of a serious financial crisis of the type that Sweden had in the early 1990s. Um, I think it was the early 1990s. Um, and of course, you know, a large parts of the Western world had um, back in 2000 and, uh, and 2000, 2008 and 2009. But is it going to have a significant recession? Um, in Sweden, yes, I think it is, in 2023. And with that very comprehensive answer, I'd now like to wrap up our Q&A session. Can we please get another round of applause from Ms. Janet Henry?